circled and ready to go. Laura, how many minutes you been holding that baby? I got a stopwatch going. All three verses. I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten so glad and free Jesus greatest highest I will come to thee Mr. Graham will you lead us in prayer tonight please Two hundred ninety-four. You can be seated. We'll do one verse, and we'll see if there's any testimonies, and then we'll sing the classic. We have a birthday. Oh yes, we have a birthday. Let's do that first, Mr. Graham. It's your birthday. No. Get your quarter out. We took him out to Texas Roadhouse. He actually rode the saddle at Texas Roadhouse. They sang happy birthday. He tried to claim he was 17 years old. Where's your quarter? Oh, wow, big spender. He tried to claim he was 17 years old. We all laughed. Happy birthday to you. And don't get chapstick. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you, and many more from heaven's shore. Yeah, it grosses me out thinking about that now. 294, first verse testimonies, and then we'll do the last verse. 294. They're taking the offering on this, ver on this song, Gene. On this song, this verse, they're taking the offering. Wait, wait, Michael, he's, he's not ready yet. Take him a while to get ready. Here we go. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, now how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light. Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Testimony. Testimony. Who has a testimony? Who has a testimony? Isabel. Testimonies. Who else? You want to lay Amen. Lay 
By the way, if you don't read the, the missionary letters on the back board, uh, Pete and Mary Muker have two new great-grandchildren that were born at the end of last year, and it's on their newsletter that I hung up there this morning. So you may want to peruse it. I saw another hand. Patrick. Amen. Was it a double? I like doubles. Yep. Well, we saw we saw God work in a mighty way too. We went out to eat, uh, Michael and Carolyn and Ruth and myself down at Perkins, and we got there and it was nice, but there was horrible looking black clouds. So we ordered and it started raining and pouring the rain. And so I said, "This is a good time to have dessert." So we had dessert. And God worked it out so we could have dessert. And it was not raining when we went out to get in the car. Anybody else? All right, last verse. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upward, still upward, we'll follow our guide. When we shall see him, the king in his beauty, happy, how happy, our place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. And 129. All three verses. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side flow. Be of sin the double cure, save from wrath. And make me pure, good my tears forever flow. Good my soul, thou must save and thou alone. In my hand the Christ I bring, simply to thy cross I cling while I draw the bleeding breath when thy heart heaves in death when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on my throne rock of ages cleft for me Myself in thee. And we have a special tonight by Autumn. She's going to come and sing for us. Check. There we go. Check, check. Check, check. So someone has been begging me and begging me and begging me and begging me to uh, do this song again in church. And it happens to be one of my favorite, dad hates this term, but my favorite praise and worship songs. So here goes. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save me. Jesus, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. 
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us, Jesus. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Going to be in the book of Revelation tonight. The book of Revelation, we're going to begin in chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, when I get there to read it. We are beginning and have now gone a week and three days into a new year. This year, I, I made some predictions. I'm going to expand upon them. One prediction I made was that God would still be on the throne and he'll still be God throughout the whole year. Another prediction I'm going to add to it is Satan will still be alive and well on planet Earth and doing his best to defeat you and I. And another prediction I want to make to you tonight from the Word of God is that God's grace is sufficient to help us overcome anything we're going to face in this new year. And we don't know what we're going to face. I just heard tonight that Marshall next Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, is going to have surgery on a hernia. And I've been through that three times. I don't, I don't look forward to him having to go through it, but it's better to do it than not to do it. Um, uh, when you think about people that are sick, when you think about surgeries that might happen to you or illnesses that might happen to you, if you are in the boyfriend-girlfriend stage, maybe you'll lose a boyfriend or a girlfriend this year to another girl or a guy. Uh, and there's just no telling what's going to come up. But the truth is, we can still find what we need in the Lord if we will look to Him and remain where we should be close to Him. In these verses we're going to read, they're to three churches of the uh, church ages, as some people believe, and each one of them will encourage us in some way. Uh, when I teach prophecy and get to this passage of Scripture, there are people that want to break these, these church churches down into specific time slots in history. Well, they may indeed fall into some specific time slot in history, but I have this underlying belief about Scripture that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that's what it tells us, and it's profitable, and it's profitable for our instruction. And so these may indeed be written about other times and other places, but there's lessons that we need and lessons that we can learn from these three churches. So if we're going to have what we need to have in this coming year, we need to heed the advice that was given to these three churches. The first one's found in chapter 2 and verse 25. Chapter 2 and verse 25. And if you'll read up in the heading, if, if you have one in your Bible, it tells me that this message is to the church at Thyatira. And this church had been uh, considered an apostate church, one that was falling away and going into false belief, into idolatry and other false doctrines. But in verse 25, Jesus says, now, now get this right, Jesus is giving this advice. Uh, there are sometimes people that want to give me advice about certain things, and I don't all, always take it. But if I read in the Word of God and Jesus is giving an instruction or a piece of advice, it's well worth heeding. It's well worth putting to practice in your life. So in this passage, Jesus speaking to the churches says, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Uh, the title of the message is get a grip on it. We sometimes look around us and we see people going through hard times. And when we leave them after praying, we can't do much else. 
A phrase that I hear and sometimes use myself is hang in there. Hang in there. Uh, you've seen the picture, I'm sure, someplace on a poster or on Facebook or somewhere of a kitten holding on to a branch, and the title under that photo says, Hang in there. Sometimes in our relationship with God and the problems we're going through, we need to learn to hang in there. When we talk about this church, it's a church that had major problems. The second church is found in chapter 3 and verse 11, and we're going to come back to each one of these thoughts, but I want to read all three of the verses for you first. And this church is written to the church at Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a word in the Greek that means what? Brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. And so when we read this, we know, and we, and we know by the testimony of the historians and also because of what we read in Scripture, that they were a mission-minded or a mission-hearted churches. And in verse 11 of chapter 3, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Get a grip. Get a grip on it. Hang in there. Hang tight. The third church that we want to, I skipped one. The second church that we needed to look at first is in Revelation 3, 2. And it's the church of Sardis. And this was a dead church where there seemed to be no life. But if you look in verse 2, it says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. In all three of these situations, God's telling these churches, hang in there, don't throw in the towel, get a grip on it, stay true, hold fast, don't give up, hang tight, just stay with the stuff. And sometimes I get discouraged. And the reason I get discouraged is because I hear of testimonies of guys I went to school with. I hear testimonies of colleges that I've known through the years, Christian colleges, and I hear of churches who are all taking the same path. And it's that they're changing and they're going away from those things which once made them great, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God as the absolute inspired Word of God, the standards and convictions that are given in the Word of God that are absolutely true. Those things that we see going on today are really disheartening. I heard recently somebody said in my presence, they said, but it's 2016, as if God's word is not the same word of God in 2016 that it was in 1611 when the translation of the King James was made, or as it was in the first century when Paul and the rest of the writers wrote the word of God, or as it was back clear to the days of Moses when Moses wrote the word of God. It does not matter if it's 2016 or 1016 or the year 16. The truth of God never changes. He never changes right and wrong. What was wrong in the days of Moses is still wrong today. What was wrong with Adam and Eve in their time is still wrong today. And we have this concept in America that things are changing and things are fluctuating and things are not always what they used to be. We need to change things. Now, it's not just in religious circles we see this. You see it in the political realm. You see it in the uh, financial realm. You see it in the education or intellectual realm. People always wanting something new, something different, change it because they don't like what's been for all those years. I quit telling people we're an old-fashioned church. I don't have old-fashioned standards and ideals anymore. I have eternal standards and ideas if they're from the Word of God. And that's the difference. It is 2016, but the advice that the Word of God gives us in 2016 is the same advice that God gave to Adam and Eve. So I want to get you this, this concept tonight in four different ways about how we re, retighten our grip or get a grip. Have you ever done anything where you had to hold on to something that was very heavy for a long period of time? Yeah. And what happens to your hands? You get tired. And it's not long before you have to somehow let go and get another grip. I've always liked playing with dogs. Dogs always have to have another grip. If you're playing tug-of-war with a dog and you're pulling, you hold long enough and that dog's going to get a better grip. And when he goes, I've got it, right? Well, let's reverse that. 
we're having a tug of war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if we don't get the right grip and we let loose long enough to think we're re-gripping, Satan's going to pull it away from us. Churches who have lost their testimony by turning away from what they used to stand for will never regain that testimony. You say, isn't that kind of harsh? Show me one that has. Show me one that has. Let me give you a testimony of a church down in Tennessee. It's called Highland Park Baptist Church. Highland Park Baptist Church was pastored for 50-some years by uh, Lee Robertson. He went there. It was a Southern Baptist church. When the Southern Baptist started going south, Lee Robertson says, we're not going south. It became an independent Baptist church. When they started saying things like you can drink and it's all right and you can lie and it's all right and situational ethics, it's all right, and they wanted to change all this stuff. No, he said, no, we're going to stick with the word of God. And that church stayed true until his retirement. They brought a man in by the name of Bowler. And Bowler was from a background that was not as strong as Lee Robertson's. It was not 10 years till, till Highland Park Baptist Church was non-existent. We used to go to Southwide at Highland Park Baptist Church and sit in an auditorium that would seat 7,000 people on one floor without a balcony. And it would be filled with preachers and their wives and the people from their church singing the good old gospel hymns. Southwide deteriorated. It went to nothing. It disbanded. Highland Park Baptist Church went to nothing and moved out into the country and changed their name. The college that was there, Tennessee Temple College, went from the biggest university, Christian university in America, to not existing at all for all practical purposes tonight. Why? Because they lost their grip on what was right. We know the Word of God tells us right from wrong, do we not? Every time I hold this book up and I tell you this is the Word of God, and it tells us the truth, it doesn't lie, you agree with me. The problem comes, we don't have a grip on it to where we're staying to where we used to be. We're compromising our standards. We're compromising our belief. We're compromising what we think God requires of us. And God's never changed. If anybody's moved, it's been us. So let me share these thoughts with you about how we tighten our grip. We need to get that grip tightened. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, it says this, we, it says, hold fast, therefore you ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. You, you need to get a, a grip on what the things are that you've heard. This book is true. It does not matter to me who you hear preach this book as long as they're preaching the truth of this book. I've known some Baptist preachers that did not preach the truth of this book. And I've known some independent preachers who were not Baptist or Methodist or anything else who do preach the truth of this book. I'm not saying that all Baptists are right and everybody else is wrong. That's not true. Highland Park Baptist Church sold out because of the leadership and went south. Tennessee Temple College was, in all, for all uh, 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 reasons, a Baptist college, but it sold out and went south. Uh, uh, the, the college I graduated from, Faithway Baptist College, sold out and went south. So it's not just that I'm picking on other denominations. I'm saying we as Baptists are letting things slip, and we're losing the heritage that we have that's based on the Word of God. Why do you think in Hebrews a writer there says, get a grip on those things which you've heard? How many messages do you think you've heard me preach over this pulpit? Let's do some quick math. 17 years I've preached across this pulpit. 17 years, three times a week I've preached across this pulpit. How many is that? How much? 20,000? 28,000, is that right? Three times a week. That's 52 weeks in a year. Three times 52 is 160, let's say. 156 a year. And then multiply that by 17. How much is that? And nobody's pulled out your iPad or your, or your calculator or worked that out yet. How many, Butch? 2,615 in 17 years. Let me, let me ask you a question. You think I've told you the truth in, in most of those times? 
Anybody here think I've intentionally stood up at this pulpit and lied to you in the last 17 years? If you think that, you ought to fire me and get a preacher in here going to tell you the truth. Now, here's the kicker. What have you done with the truth that you've heard preached and taught across this pulpit? Add that to the number of times we've had evangelists come in and we've had week-long meetings. Add that to the number of times we've had Sunday school teachers teach and what they've taught you. Add that to the number of times that you've read the scriptures for yourself. And what do we do? Sometimes our grip gets tired because of all the battles we're going through and because of all the people that are trying to influence us. Here's the truth. Peer pressure is just as hard for an adult to put up with as it is for a kid to put up with. And when your family says to you, you don't need church all the time, when your family says, why do you believe that? You don't really believe that, do you? How can you, and they start to question your beliefs that come from the word of God. That's peer pressure. And sometimes people get hired and they get uh, uh, have a problem continuing to hold the grip on what they know to be right simply because people are pushing them away from it. We should be careful about that. Hold fast. What does it say in Hebrews? What I just read to you? It says, hold fast. Let me find my, my reference again. Hold fast uh, to those things which you have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, let me ask you a question. If your son or your daughter were hiking with you and they slipped and fell over the edge of a cliff and you had a rope and they were on a ledge about to fall the rest of the way off of that cliff, maybe 150 feet down. And you throw them the rope, and you tell them, tie that rope around yourself. And the only thing keeping them from falling 150 feet more to their death is the grip you have on that rope. How steadfast are you going to hold on to that rope? Well, you say, Brother Gary, that's silly. Somebody's life depends on that. Can I not convince you tonight that if you lose your grip on the teaching and the principles and the truth of the Word of God, somebody's eternal life may depend upon that? Just as real as that loved one hanging over the precipice, that loved one hanging over a cliff, and the rope being in your hands? I remember a movie I saw years ago. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was called The Man in the Mountain with Spencer Tracy. And it was an airplane crash up on a, on a high mountain over in the Alps. And this one man had been the only one that had been successful in climbing that mountain. And he was old now, but his son knew that there was treasure in that airplane. And he knew if he could get to that airplane first, he could claim the treasure. And so they go up on that mountain and his son slips and they're tied together. And he holds the rope so hard that as it's slipping through his hands, it burns to the point that it takes the hide off and his hands start to bleed. Can you understand that type of love and commitment? Well, folks, holding fast to the Word of God this year may be the difference between an eternal life and death for somebody that you know. You can play church, and you can play around with it, and you can act like the world, and you can live like the world if that's what you want to do. Nobody can make you do anything different, but you need to understand there may be some eternal consequences that will be paid because of that. You may drink socially with somebody. You may go to places that you shouldn't go with somebody else just to make them happy, but you need to understand that there may be eternal consequences linked to that action because we've let that, those things slip that we know to be true. We know they're true, not because Brother Gilbert says them, but because the Word of God spells them out and tells us right from wrong all the time. How should a husband act? Not what I think, what God says. How should a wife act? Not what I think, what God says. How should a deacon act? Not what I think, but what God says. How should teenagers act? Not what I think, but what God says. This book is what we cannot let slip. You may forget messages that I preach. I know you do. There's been times it's been very embarrassing. A couple times down at Nanny's apartments, they would tell me, uh, we, we really enjoyed church Sunday, and I'd say, what I preach on? They couldn't recall. I'm sure it happens. But, folks, we dare not let the truths of this word of God slip out of our memory and out of our grasp. There's too much at stake. I would tell you, secondly, not only do we need to retighten our grip or hold fast to the word of God, but secondly, we need to renew our minds through remembrance. Who wants to read tonight? 
Who wants, let's make this a little more like a lesson. I don't want to just scold you. I want you to read. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Isabel, thank you for volunteering. 1, 12 and 13. That's just after 1 Peter. <clears throat> or you could let Pat look it up for you. <laughs> One. Now, let me ask you a question. We just determined I preached almost 2,700 messages probably across this pulpit, right? Do you think there's not some repetition in those 2,700 messages? You know how many people don't like a church that preaches the truth over and over and over again? They're looking for some new doctrine that will thrill them and fancy them. Yeah. Folks, there are no new doctrines. And the writer here, Peter, knew that. And he said clearly, my job is not to teach you something new. It's to renew in your mind, strengthen in your mind, call back to your remembrance what you know to be true. How quickly we're prone to forget and let go because we've lost the battle in our mind. In the book of Philippians, often in the book of Philippians, it talks about this mind. But the one that's so important and speaks to me so often is the one that says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to have the same mind. The first century church was of one accord. And that mind was the mind of the things of the word of God. And we need to be reminded. Why do we have every, every uh, February, why do we set that aside as a stewardship month? Because people need to be reminded and encouraged and challenged. Why do we have revivals once or twice a year? You hear, you've heard the messages and you know what revival means. It's so we will be encouraged and reminded to do what we need to do to have a revival. How many times did you teach your children how to tie their shoes before they had a down pat? I never could quite figure out all those little sayings to take the bunny rabbit ears and you do something and the bow comes out. I read about a preacher not long ago said he, he never thought he had a problem tying his shoes. always thought it was easy till his 13-year-old son had a stroke and had to learn to tie his shoes with one hand, and now he can tie his shoes with one hand. Have you ever thought about trying to tie your shoes with one hand? Whew, I couldn't do it, I don't think. My point is we need to be reminded. We know the truth. We know what the Bible says. Let me prove it to you. Should a Christian pray? Should a Christian go to church? Yes. Should a Christian drink? No. Should a Christian cuss? No. Should a Christian witness? Yes. Should a Christian sing joyful songs? Yes. Should a Christian serve the Lord? Yes. Should a Christian be caught in places when Jesus comes with lost people doing things that lost people are doing? No. 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 All those things you know already. I, I keep telling myself, you know, I feel like I repeat too much. I feel like I say the same things. Sometimes I even have that saying about getting people to come to church all the time, beating a dead horse. But people need to be challenged all the time because, you see, here's the truth. You folks know that. But the folks that lay out a church, one of these days may get you to start feeling like, well, if so-and-so doesn't need it on Sunday night and Wednesday night, maybe I don't need it on Sunday night or Wednesday night. Hey, I've been saved since I was 12 years old. 12 from 66 is 54 years. I still need to be in church. I go to church every time I can here. I very seldom, and those of you who have been here for 17 years know, I very seldom ever take a day off because I'm sick. If we're out of town, I don't like being out of town because I have to, have to miss church. But I don't take a day off. I want to be in church. I go to chapel on Tuesdays when I'm down there teaching. I could stay out of chapel. I choose to go to chapel. When they have their Bible conference down there, I choose to go to Bible conference. When we have the opportunity once a year to go to a Bible conference, I go to a Bible conference. Now, I'm not bragging on me, but I'm saying this clearly. 
if I've been in Bible college five and a half years, if I've been saved for 54 years, and I still need to be in church, don't you think you need to be in church? So don't let anybody convince you the church isn't important. This needs to be a priority place. And we know that, but we need to be reminded. We know we ought to tithe. We know we ought to witness. But we still need to be encouraged and reminded on a regular basis. Sometimes you have to tell somebody many times, and finally it's like a light bulb goes off over their head. And then you know what they say? Well, I don't know why I didn't realize this before. Right? Tithing's that way. You tell people about tithing, and they say, well, I can't afford until they start tithing. And then they say, I don't know why I didn't believe God before. I was talking to somebody just recently that said they were going to have to start living by faith. I said, we better be careful about starting that because it's so much fun, you may not want to stop it. And that's the truth. So we need to be reminded that refer or that remembrance needs to be strengthened. Our mind needs to win that battle before things ever happen. We need to have that in our mind that truth never changes. And here's the thing. If you win the battle in your mind ahead of the battle, the battle's already won. Here's how it works. I don't drink. So somebody comes up to me and offers me a bottle of free beer. I don't have to worry about the answer. It's already been made. I don't have to worry about that battle. It's already been won. The answer is no thank you. Somebody, uh, I was, how many, how, I'm not going to ask you that. Uh, the lottery is going to be almost a billion dollars, maybe over a billion dollars Powerball by next week. If you buy a ticket, don't tell me, but you do need to tithe. We went through this at one time with, with Todd Bow, and he says, if somebody won the lottery and wanted to give the money to the church, would you take it? I said, well, I wouldn't ask where it came from. Would I? How many of you put money in the offering today? Did I ask any of you where it came from? Now, if suddenly we get a million-dollar check in the offering, I'm going to get suspicious. But you know, I'm kind of joking about this. But Paul said, you know, eat what's set before you and ask no questions. Somebody else said the devil's had that money long enough. But the truth is, I don't play the lottery. Somebody, they were kidding Ben Carson this morning on Fox News about it. Uh, have you gotten your lottery tickets? You know his response was just like that? I don't waste my money that way. He's probably a millionaire. I mean, he was chief surgeon at John Hopkins and, and very, very active on boards of companies and all. I wouldn't doubt he's a millionaire. I don't waste my money like that. You think Warren Buffett plays the lottery? So we know, and so the battle's won if you make up your mind and strengthen your mind and remember what God said. What do we do? Uh, let me give you, for instance, we just had a church outing with our teenagers, and the, the girls were required because of the dress code of the other church that was sponsoring it to wear either culottes or a skirt or a skirt with um, leggings, leggings underneath it. And the girls were panicking. Well, I'm not going then. Well, why not? All they're asking you to do is be modest. Would you really like to go jumping on a trampoline and have your um, whitey tidy showing? Let's just put it that way. Well, of course not. Settle those issues with God's word. Then you don't have to worry about it. Settle the issues in your mind with the truth of God's word and strengthen your mind, and you don't have to worry about it. But too many times we let it slip. We let somebody else convince us that what we know is right. We let it go, and we let it slip. Thirdly, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Patrick, you might want Isabel to look it up for you. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Here's the third thing we need to do, and the third thing is we need to renew or reaffirm or begin for the first time a wholesome spiritual work ethic. Now, what is a work ethic? What is a good work ethic? Barbara? No one's watching. You're doing it the right way anyway. Okay, that's one part of it. Ruth, what did you say? 
whatsoever the Bible says thy hand findeth to do, do heartily as unto the Lord. That's a good work ethic. That's as Barbara said, if nobody's watching you, you still do your job. That's if, if everybody else sloughs off and everybody else stops doing what's right. You still do what's right. That's a good work ethic. Knowing that the work we're doing is not a, a physical work, it's a spiritual work. I don't know how to, how to get people to understand that every time you do service in the church, it is not physical work, it's spiritual work. Carol and Michael clean the church every week. That work, a lot of people would say, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not cleaning them toilets. Let somebody else do that. Well, a good somebody else is doing it. They're both somebodies in God's book because they're willing to do it. But don't you think a good, clean toilet, if a visitor comes in and sees a good, clean toilet, makes a good impression on that visitor as they come in? If they come in and the floors are vacuumed, and the dirt's up, and the cobwebs are down as much as you can in a building this old. It has probably 13,000 spiders dwelling within 12 inches of where you're sitting. Don't you think that that's a good testimony? Of course it is. When we have a work day and we do something outside, we paint the, the deck or we repair the deck or we put windows in or whatever we do, it looks to me like people would understand we're not doing it on a physical level. We're doing it to glorify the Lord. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. We need to understand that work ethic spiritually is important. Now, how am I going to apply that? What kind of a work ethic do you have about your daily devotions? What kind of a work ethic do you have about telling other people about the Savior? What kind of a work ethic do you have when it comes to reading your Bible and praying every day? What kind of a work ethic do you have about being the testimony to your immediate family that you, that you need to be? You know what? Uh, if every wife and every husband would make up their mind to have a good spiritual work ethic, it would go something like this. Well, honey, I'm not sure that I want to go to church today. I'm not feeling very good. Well, are you throwing up? No. Well, are you contagious? No. Then why aren't we going to church? Got deathly quiet in the crowd. Because you know I'm right. Sometimes we get up, we don't always feel good. I didn't feel good this morning. I, didn't, I felt worse yesterday. I went to bed early, got a good night's sleep, thought I was going to feel great when I got up this morning. Still didn't feel great. Went home, wanted to get a nap this afternoon. Of course, the football game was on, so I watched a little bit of that. I babysat a um, uh, little dude for a while, and, of course, that took up a good bit of time and didn't get a good nap like I wanted to. I don't feel real hot tonight, just to be honest with you. It's not what it's all about. That decision's already been made. You understand? When we are getting a work ethic, we have a job to do to serve the Lord. If we don't do it, it won't get done. I, I've been talking about the bus routes that we have now. We're wanting to start another route, but we cannot start another route and do it right until I have a bus driver and a bus captain for the route we have now. And I don't mean that you're just going to do it once in a while. I mean, you're going to commit yourself to it. It's going to be a labor of love that you're going to make it your route, and you want to serve the Lord by getting kids in so that they can hear the gospel and get saved, and then they can hear the word of God and be growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have Sunday school rooms right now that we could fill with another class or two, but we can't because we don't have teachers that will make it their ministry. Not just do it when you want to. No. A work ethic means you do it even if you don't feel like doing it. One thing Pat brought out a couple of years ago. How long has it been since you did spiritual gifts? Two years? Two years ago he brought out in a spiritual gifts class the book that my brother wrote that I don't always agree with everything my brother did, but this is one thing that he did pretty good that I liked. Uh, he, he talked about the difference between Generation X and baby boomers and pre-baby boomers. I was born right at the beginning of the baby boomer era. I was born in 49, and I think it cut off at 47, which was, I don't even remember what they called that other group before that. But the group before that had a real sense of duty. I do it because it has to be done. If nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. Baby boomers have the idea, well, I'll do it if I have time. And Generation X, the, the next generation, says, well, I'm not going to do it at all. I, I kind of tend toward that pre-baby boomer stage where if it has to be done, I'm going to get it done. 
I, I may not feel it's my calling, but if it's got to be done, I'm going to do it. You know how many times I've cleaned toilets in this church? Vacuumed floors, washed windows, driven nails, picked up benches, put benches together, worked on all the time. It's not your job. You're the pastor. Let the deacons do that. Well, sometimes the deacons can't. If it needs to be done, I'm going to do it. Why? I want to have a good work ethic for the Lord. Now, let me tell you from a physical standpoint a couple of things my daddy taught me. And I know your daddy probably read the same training manual my daddy taught, read. The first one was, and I've mentioned it, if a man hires you for eight hours a day, you give him eight and a half hours of good work for eight hours in a day and you will always find work, and you will always get promotions, and you will always have money. Second thing was, anything worth doing is worth doing right the first time. Don't have to be told to go back and redo it. And by the way, can I throw this out to you? In God's work, it's very important to do it right the first time because you may not get a second chance. You may never get a second. You know, when I get up to preach, I don't know who's saved and who's not saved, but if there's any doubt in my mind, if I'd have stood up tonight and I wasn't pretty certain everybody in this room was saved, you know how much more time I'd have spent on salvation in this message tonight? Because I don't want to miss that one chance that I might have. When we have a cantata, why do we always give an invitation and have a short message at the end of it? Because I don't want to miss that one chance for one visitor that might be here for the only time to hear the gospel. We should renew or start again or turn up the heat on our work ethic, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Spiritual things need to get done, and it requires diligence, and sometimes it just requires stick to itiveness, duty, doing it because it has to be done, and somebody needs to do it. We're all somebodies in God's sight. There's no little people around here. Uh, and, and I'm going to say this again. I'm going to say it nicely. And if it makes you mad, too bad. Uh, somebody put on Facebook last week, and I liked it. They said, if you didn't like all the posts I put filled with Bible, Scripture verses last year and uh, spiritual things, uh, you better just suck it up, honey, because this year is going to be more of the same. Well, here's the truth. I hear people say from time to time, there's just a few people that run that church up there. Well, there is, but you're welcome to join. It's only a few people that run it because you can't get people out to business meetings. There's only a few people that run it because they're the only ones that want to do anything. There's only a few people that run it because nobody else is there to put their input in when you're trying to come up with plans and decisions to go forward. If you want to be a part of that few people, you're more than welcome. It's not a click. It's not that everybody's there and somebody's not allowed to come in. Come on in. Get your feet wet. There's plenty to do. We have folks in this building, in this room tonight, that would like to give off a hat or two, I'm sure. So we don't have that. Everybody is the same. We're on level playing ground here. The fourth one is this, and it's found in 2 Peter 3.17. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert, for volunteering. 2 Peter Here's the fourth one. We need to resolve this year and commit this year and commit every day to be steadfast. Not to get away from what we know to be true, but to be steadfast. You, do not, you never know who's going to try to lead you the first step away from the truth. If somebody says to a man, the Bible says... You're the head of your household. You just make that woman subservient to you. You keep her barefoot and pregnant, and God will be happy with you. He's lied to you. Now, if you're some macho, egotistical brute, you're going to fall for that lie rather easily. I talked to somebody just recently, and they said they were raised that a man doesn't shed tears and shows emotion. I said, those people lied to you. God's word says different. What I'm saying is you don't know who's going to be the one to push your button to get you started away from God. 
So you better make up your mind that you're going to stay where you started with the Word of God. You're going to stay where you started with the Word of God as far as getting your spiritual food from that day. Let other people shift if they want. Let them move their uh, lines of demarcation if they want. Let them change the styles and the plans and the, the, the methods if they want. I'm not against changing methods, but I'm against changing methods that take us away from the truth of God. I posted on Facebook since my daughter brought it up tonight about uh, praise and worship music. It was a, a statement by a man who was a praise and worship leader. Um, is that what they call them, praise leaders, worship leaders? And he, he said that he had gotten away from it, and he gave his testimony about why. And the main thing he said that you've heard me say is because most of the new music does not contain deep doctrines of the faith of the Word of God. They're fluffing stuff. Now, some aren't. Uh, the one, uh, um, I started to say Rebecca Carolyn. What's your name? Autumn sang tonight. Is, is not one of those. I like that one. We lift him up. He did come from on high, and he did die, and he's going back. That's a scriptural song. Uh, I heard somebody not long ago, I heard a good preacher not long ago say that he did not like the song. Uh, what's the one about the deer that panneth? As the deer panneth after the water brook. You know the one I'm talking about? He didn't like that. And I'm thinking to myself, it's a quotation from the book of Psalms. <laughs> how can you not like it? I mean, how can you go against somebody singing scripture? I didn't understand it. I like songs that come from scripture. And like I've told you before, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'll tell you where that saying comes from one of these days if we have time. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Not all new music is bad music, but all new music is not good music. Not all old music is good music. Not all old music is bad music. You have to look at the content. But anyway, this, this praise and worship song uh, leader who had a, fu a full-time job in a big church got away from it and started leading more and more of the old-fashioned hymns. And why? Because there's doctrine that doesn't change in those old-fashioned hymns. It's not about our feelings. It's not about what we think. It's about what God's Word says. So we get to the point where we're going to hang on no matter what. I'm going to close with Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. And it says this. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same, there, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now verse 42 is important. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. We need to make up our mind. We're not moving. We're not changing. We're not going the direction of so many other people. We don't have time to waste trying to decide whether it's right or wrong. Bill Hybels, I think is his name, out in the Midwest somewhere, pastored a, a large uh, contemporary church. And he made the statement that his ministry was not making any better impact being a contemporary ministry than was making if they had stayed or become a traditional, which is what we are, ministry. And so they're having to rethink the direction they're taking. Can I tell you the truth? I'm not rethinking our direction. What we do, we do because of the Word of God. We, we have teenagers that have grown up in our church. Some have stayed and some have gone. But the ones that have gone have gone not to the good direction, but away from the direction. And I'm not being mean to other families. I have two boys that made the same decision. They know the truth. They don't want the truth. They want a new direction. We're not contemplating that. Why? Because we're going to stay, be steadfast on what we know is right and what we know is true. So this year, what are you going to do when Satan's firing up the, the anvil? He, he's beating out his swords. He's beating out his spear heads. And he's gearing up for battle if we don't renew our grip and get a grip on what we know is right and stay with it. Father, thank you for the time and your word tonight. And I pray as we leave this place, you'd remind us that, God, you are the king what you say is true. The commandments in your word are not like a buffet that we can take some and leave others, but when your word says it, we need to apply it. We need to stop making excuses. We just need to do it. Do our duty. Find a place to serve. Dig in. Dig our foxhole. 
dig in for the duration of the battle, and stay put doing what we do for you. Help us to become stronger as we renew our strength every day in the Word of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.